uh, it, it is incumbent upon us with those two numbers I talked about, uh, that if we want to have the influence to affect these issues, we need to build our community significantly. That's when I talk about email ads, you know, sign up for our emails. Tell five friends, please, to sign up for our emails. We need to build up so that we can talk to tens of thousands of people at once more easily. That's when politicians are going to start to listen to our concerns. So for, from my perspective, with the Secular Coalition for America, we lobby and we lobby effectively, and we're gonna lobby more effectively as we continue to grow, but without the people on the ground, without, for example, a Secular Coalition for Pennsylvania, which we don't yet have, we're less effective in Pennsylvania. Why should a politician listen when they don't hear? I mean, they don't hear because we haven't talked to them. We haven't organized and, and uh, gone through the grassroots training that we offer and then gone and organized a meeting to members of Congress. We, they have to know we exist. I was a secular American myself. I, I, even though I went, I went to Notre Dame, I was in the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, but I was never religious, I don't know. <laughs> but, but I was totally secular since I was a kid. But I, and I'm a politician. I like to talk and smile and say hi or whatever. I never met anyone from any of our organizations. I would have wanted to, never met a soul. We have to change that. We have to make it different. So that's what you can do. I mean, obviously we love contributions. Obviously we love you to just write your member of Congress. But the biggest thing that could happen would be to see a secular coalition in a major state like Pennsylvania. Number three. Um, towards the end of your 10 points, you referred to Zoning yes. Property uh, situations for religious institutions. Does, do, do you see in making changes there also putting at risk other not for profit advantages as well? Um, well, there's, or is there a way, or there's, there be a way to segregate? There's two different uh, parts to this. Um, I think what you're thinking of quite correctly is, uh, for instance, tax exemptions for churches, which churches will come back and say, as they've said to me, well, yeah, there's tax exemptions for churches. There's also tax exemptions for 501c3 nonprofits, so quit your whining, effectively, you know, back to us. Uh, and I want to address that. What I was more specifically referencing, and I'll come back to the IRS issue, is something that's maybe not as much known in our community, but is an outrage. Uh, it's the Religious Freedom Restoration Act from 1991. It was declared unconstitutional, and they passed another one in the late 1990s. Let me give you an example of the more limited version which, which the courts have upheld so far that now is on the books. And this is a federal statute, which for those of you who have a libertarian bent and a lot of conservatives, I find it ironic because it's the ultimate uh, reversal of local control, as you'll see. What it says is that religious organizations can, to some degree, exempt themselves from environmental laws and zoning laws that apply. And one of the more uh, outrageous cases and noteworthy cases, in my view, is out in Boulder County, Colorado. The folks there had the political will. We're talking about local control. The folks in Boulder County, Colorado, passed a kind of zoning law, a green space law, if you will, for that county. And it was to apply equally, as, in my view, laws should apply equally. Uh, however, because of the federal statute from here in Washington, the local megachurch sued, and they succeeded. And they said, well, it's, uh, it's a part of our beliefs, and therefore we're exempted from some of uh, the environmental and zoning laws that apply to, and think who it applies to. It applies to secular nonprofits. It applies to secular for-profits. It applies to private individuals. So it applies to everybody else except them. So they can ignore uh, zoning laws. And in some cases with these mega churches, you're talking about serious land use. So it's, it's not a minor exemption. You know, there's other aspects that were originally intended by the law, at least in my perception, ones that were more acceptable about uh, whether or not uh, the rabbi has to walk to uh, 
you know, on Saturday or something to church, or whether or not the Native Americans can use their peyote. But to me, those are affecting you individually, not society as a whole, and I see a big distinction. Unfortunately, they've been successful in that. Now, if I could go back quickly to what I think is a more commonly understood issue about the IRS code, we definitely are going to take on that issue. And let me offer three ways that religions get a distinct privilege from a typical 501c3 nonprofit, which I think is outrageous. I mean, because let's take a 501c3 nonprofit and let's take a megachurch. Uh, 501c3 nonprofit, say there's a woman who runs a 501c3 that helps poor babies with AIDS. All of her money, uh, you know, is sort of subject to public disclosure. This executive director of the nonprofit, she has to file a 990 with the IRS explaining the finances. You don't want the fiduciary obligations of contributors to be mistreated. Uh, her focus is these little babies with AIDS, not anything else. Contrast this with what happens with a church. Now, let's tell anybody know who Joyce Meyer is. Joyce Meyer is, is the biggest woman uh, fundamentalist minister in the United States and one of the biggest in the United States, period. Uh, she, her organization took in, a, and this is from a, either Dateline or one of those news programs, took in over $100 million. And they did a bunch of ads, you know, and they'd show her in Africa with poor kids or something. And so they took in over $100 million. When they looked at how much, tried to analyze how much was actually going to the people that were supposed to be helped, it was like 14 million. Where the rest went, I don't know. But if you go look at her house, which you can look at online, check it out, or you can video that I did about this on YouTube, uh, it's IRS loopholes, and her house, which is a palace. I mean, it's multiple buildings, vast, you know, separate auto uh, garages, and just she lives like a queen. And you help pay because they have the parsonage exemption. And a lot of people don't know about this. In the IRS code, there's a special exemption for the parsonage. Robert Schuler, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Crystal Cathedral out in California. He had something like eight ministers who got the parsonage exemption. That is their house, their residence is exempt. And, funny coincidence, three were members of his family that got this exemption. You're all paying for that. And the woman that I talked about before with her nonprofit that helps the poor babies with AIDS and spends all its money on the poor babies with AIDS, she doesn't get any exemption for her house. No way. Also, the church, that 990 I mentioned, that sort of discloses the finances, the church doesn't have to file a 990. So they don't have to file a 990. It's like a black box. You can't see inside the finances of a church to know what the heck is going on. Where's that money going to? Then they, get the, then they openly get this uh, loophole. And then, this is the kicker, in IRS regs, but it has the force of law, you have to have the permission of a high IRS official. I think that's the phrasing, a high IRS official, in order to do an audit of a church. So if you've ever been on the board of a nonprofit or worked for a nonprofit, their getting audited is not an unusual event. Nonprofits get audited all the time. But when you're a church, it's much less frequent, partly because this extra hurdle that a high IRS official has to approve uh, the, uh, doing a, doing a, the seeking of an audit. Uh, so those are three areas where they are distinctly treated in the law. And of course, on a principled basis, I question it overall because when you give to a 501c3 nonprofit, you're giving to that mission. When you give to a church, a lot of times they talk about, let's help kids in Africa, but it's very difficult to know how much really goes to the poor kids in Africa. One really heinous example is uh, Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham, runs uh, uh, Samaritan's Purse, very nice charitable sounding name, but at one incident at one of their churches in Africa, I mean one of their, excuse me, one of their hospitals in Africa was they were talking to one of the patients who was in desperate need of care and they said, well, are you Christian? The person who's sick says, uh, no, said, well, we, we need to talk to you about Jesus first. And, and, you know, so that is an organization which, by the way, gets some of our federal tax money as a faith-based organization. So they get some of their federal tax money. They don't have to file a 990. He, you know, Franklin Graham gets a sweet deal in his house. You see what I'm talking about in terms of the distinctions that they receive before you even get to how, uh, you know, a typical 501c3 gets tax exemption. So there's a lot we can bring up that's critically important about how they are distinctly treated. And a lot of times things that our population doesn't even know about. So I want to try to spread the word about the, our concerns. 
I don't know if that answers. Next number. What is the uh, history of that, that exemption? The parsonage? What, what's the name? Yeah, the parsonage exemption. How long has that been around? There was there an expansion, I believe, in the 1950s. Some, st you know, because everything there's state, there's local, there's federal. I mean, the income tax code came into existence in 1913, and I think there was something more modest from the 20s, and then it got expanded in the 50s and so forth. Um, there was a controversy uh, because our friend Rick Warren, remember him of inaugural fame? Rick Warren, by the way, who compared Terry Schiavo's husband to a Nazi. That's, that's Rick Warren for you. Jake, Rick Warren, who after, he's always bragging about how much he gives to charity, after what he gives to charity, which, by the way, comes from sales of books and things that his church can promote, so it's pretty sweet deal, deal there as well. He's worth something ac approaching $11 million, personally. You know. Anyway, Rick Warren, he had for his residence, where they were basically changing the valuation of his house so they could basically pump up the amount of, of income that he had through an artificial means. The federal government, though, and this shows you what a challenge we have in Washington, they all bent over backwards to take care of him in this sense. They said, well, you do have to have true value for your home. They at least required that, and that was passed in 2001 or so. But they still allow for the exemption, so you still get a full exemption, and there's no uh, gauging for the value of the home. So when you have a Joyce Meyer type home, and I encourage you all, you can go look at my video on YouTube. It shows her house, you know, from like a Google Maps view. You see what I'm talking about. This is not, you know, a little modest cottage <laughs> that we're talking about. All, all with your help, your tax dollars helping to subsidize her home. Yeah. Uh, but I, did I skip number or number four? Yes. The question is answered. I, I was going to ask about the, or, the ten organizations. Yes, and I would encourage you to help out and uh, s support our ten member organizations. AHA has got its its uh, plug here, and maybe you know, please take a look of our ten. And also, there's some that specifically, you might know someone who might have a distinctive interest, like military atheists. Like maybe you know someone who is in the service or was in the service. It's real important. We're meeting, we just met with Senator Levin's office, Senator Levin's chair of the Armed Services Committee. And uh, there's really heinous stuff that's gone on in recent decades in the United States military. Scandals at the Air Force Academy, uh, people in... I mean, we're talking about major officers in uniform proselytizing for fundamentalist Christianity in uniform in a videotape. Real serious violations of the separation of church and state. Now they have, I don't know if you've heard about this, a spiritual fitness test in the United States military. Spiritual fitness test. And if you aren't spiritually fit, they send you away off times and suggest you go to a minister. I mean, this is outrageous. My father, who served in the military, obviously many years ago, is, is just appalled by this and just the thought that you're going to have in the U.S. military somebody making any kind of implication about your religion is anathema. And, and given you know, what we've seen in foreign countries and throughout American history, uh, having religion and the military in any way conjoined is, is about as dangerous as it gets. So please get involved in any of our 10 member organizations. I encourage you to uh, support all of them. Number five. Uh, question, uh, you were talking about uh, an atheist for president and how it might yep. may or may not have happened and the idea of, well, an African-American may or may not have happened in the past 1960, Roman Catholic, you know. Right. It was bad. And actually, ironically, today is uh, Bobby Kennedy's assassination. That's true. Yeah. 43 years. 43 years. Um, so he's been dead longer than he's been alive. Uh, but the question I have for you is, what, what is the association, your association, doing to, without moving the field? Why would like come back, or at least uh, educate against the Michelle Bachman? No. Or the Mitt Romney's, who are running very aggressively. Right. Well, if you're talking about in the presidential race itself, uh, to some degree my book might be helpful. Uh, the attack of the theocrats really talks about the change in our country and what we need to do about it, and that will come out in time so that the, the primaries won't be over. And uh, we want to speak out publicly about the, the nature of theocracy in this country. On the Hill, we speak up all the time. Every time there's an issue, we'll speak out about those issues. And we're initiating uh, issues. Um, certainly in my book, I summarize a, a number of the more uh, 
outlandish statements uh, from Michelle Bachman and, and others. Uh, but for us, we are not, just to be clear, a pack. We don't endorse candidates. We, in fact, are politically neutral. Furthermore, I try my best to bring as many Republicans in as I can. We still find some. I usually have more luck with libertarians than I do with Republicans. Uh, but we're a nonpartisan organization. So we don't expressly endorse or not endorse. But in our blogging, in our public statements, if she says something that's 